Hello and welcome. Season 4, episode 13. The season finale of season 4 of the Voido podcast. With me as always, Kavita Shanoi. Hello, hello. Good morning. Good morning. Man, this has been a long season. It has. It's been It has. a long, long season and we've, we've had many guests. But we had no breaks. In yeah. the, I don't know why, it's just... Maybe there were no holidays. That's why. Usually we had holidays sometimes in the week. Oh. Usually we protested and said, "I want to do this," but they, I don't think we were allowed to. This no, time. no. This time we actually made sure we did. We recorded every single week this time, and we had guests, and yeah. we made sure that we got interesting guests. And uh, we opened the season with Krishna Rao. Yes, yes. And it seemed like a really long time ago. Yeah, it yeah, wasn't. certainly did. So what we're going to do today is let's wrap up the week, and then we'll do a review of the season and tell me your uh, favorite. favorite episodes sure what are you watching though ah <laughs> so um i'm watching many things at the same time that's nice um i just finished breakpoint on netflix uh which was fun it, it wasn't as uh intense intense as drive to survive but uh, it was nice and i've been told that the the one about the tour de france is supposed to be insanely yeah interesting so that's next on my list But I've also been on a bit of a Zoya Akhtar trip, so because Made in Heaven dropped, and that's something I'm in the middle of right now, I went back and I watched the parts of the earlier season. I watched Gully Boy, I watched Dil Dhadak Ne Do. So I've been on a bit of a Zoya Akhtar trip. I I really like her work. Yeah, it's fun to watch. It's quite contemporary. Yeah, and layered. How do you like the Made in Heaven season? I really like it. I really like. Did you do you remember the previous season? I did. I did. I watched some recaps and thought about it. I I like that they're not afraid to take. Issues, head uh, on, head on. Yeah, I like it. I like. I it. think when the first season came out, it was very surprising, very gritty. It was also very surprising from a storyline perspective. Yeah, right. And how seemingly well-to-do people would have such archaic, yeah, uh, beliefs. I think this time around we were geared up to expect it, so we almost felt a little let down by the fact that it's going to happen. But actually, they were talking about similar issues. Still very well yeah. done. It's also so well produced. Yes, the sets and the outfits and. And Jobita looks so beautiful. It's always gorgeous, always. stunning, really good. I I binged it. I just I just devoured it over the weekend. Murders in the Building is also out. It is. Yeah, uh, there are three episodes down. I am really behind on my content game in the last like two months. I missed all of the theatrical releases. Yeah. And I didn't know. Murders is out. No. Yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, it's uh, it's different. You got medal there, so you mm. can see that they have upped their game of considerably. Course. But it's um, it's interesting. It's an interesting start to the season, and uh, good actors. So you're you're getting a lot more than you expected on 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 your small screen. I'm also watching this uh, uh, series, which is from a book uh, called "The Lost Flowers of Alice Hart." Okay, it's written by uh, this lady called Holly Ringland. It's set in Australia. It's a very Again, very gritty, different kind of a watch. Um, I won't give anything away. It's it's being released slowly, as it should, because it's every episode is so heavy, so layered. You got to sit with it for a while. And uh, uh, there's Signori Viva in it. It is it is a it's a really good watch, but it's not one of those that you can. I don't know whether you can watch it with your uh, kids, and uh, and it's a very it's a very like. individual private kind of a watch it's almost like reading a book it's so layered and it's 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 really nice i like that while we've always talked about watching movies in the theater versus watching stuff at home on the tv and how much we love it i've realized that there's one thing that i haven't done in years which is watch something on a laptop by myself like yeah. in bed yeah it used to it used to be a thing it, it, it used to be a thing yeah but i also now also feel that because there is such an intimate connection between you and content uh that we that we created for ourselves by watching them on our phones or uh, yeah uh, well I'll stop there watching them on our phones and then moving to watching it on television that now watching anything that's either intimate or layered or you want to get into it right you really need to have a quiet house you can't have people walking across the television you can't have you can't be worried that your child is going to come down you know and disturb the scene or you're like oh my god i need to change the channel or Can we all just watch yeah. this? Because you're in the quiet... middle of an experience. Correct. So uh, that's a little disturbing. But uh, the other day I was listening to a, a podcast on the town. I was telling you about it, right? Uh, 
they were talking about how AI is going to be is going to be wedged in into this entire into Hollywood production. And one of the things that they are they they are they are actually thinking about right now is how scripts can be churned out by AI. You 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 upload season one to seven, and then season eight is written by this AI tool. And um, certain things that they believe that should be done by AI is the fact that your television is going to be your second screen, and that your phone is your primary screen. So when you're telling a story, instead of it being disinvolving, where if you miss even a single scene, you have to go back in time and and pick up the thread, they keep reintroducing characters, reestablishing the plot, so that you can genuinely have a second screen open, which is your television, and be on your phone, which is your primary screen, and be distracted. And if you notice in the past, when we had serialized content, you would always have a recap. Uh, they, they would always be very slow, dun, 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 that would happen on every scene to give you an alert that something is happening, right? And there would always be re-establishments of people's evilness or their character or the plot in itself, and that's coming back, which is a waste of time for a lot of the writers to sit back and write out. So AI is being used there to be able to write that out, and I think that's what every writer even wants, saying just let the the grunt work be done. But it is a th- it is a it is a tactic. I didn't know that it was a it's a deliberate tactic because you need to keep a light huh. on 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 um, screen. I know because in cer- certain um, in certain serials when it's subtitled and it's a different language, you, you don't have a year out for it. You're always saying pause, pause, pause. I'm coming back. But with any other, which if it's English or Hindi, you're like let it run. I I can hear I can what's hear happening. I'll, I'll join you. Well, and I don't go fetch popcorn, fetch a glass, or, pop, popcorn, yeah. a glass of water, or my drink, or whatever else. And you know you don't want to disturb anybody else's watching viewing experience. But um, yeah, so there is, there's a lot that hap- that's lots that that's happening on the content side, and uh, it's also it's also you know going to start uh, increasing because summer is kind of getting over in the US, and let's hope that their writer strike also gets over. But there's a lot to be unpacked in terms of why they are not signing on their um, their contracts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Some say that it's going to go on for months. It's going to really affect everybody else who doesn't have very deep library content. Yeah, but also maybe it'll. I give... miss uh, late night stand up. Yeah, Trevor Noah's in town. I think he's. I mean, he was got out of the scene before all this happened. Yeah. But maybe their tour. Maybe live events will come back. Maybe people will start exploring newer things rather than just writing scripted content. Who knows? Maybe this is like never waste a crisis. Maybe this is what Bollywood. Uh, Hollywood the the NBA goes into this lockdown every few years, where they have a players' association, and then there's usually a strike where they don't agree on what's called the collective bargaining agreement. It's basically the union of players versus the association. And then there have been multiple times in the last decade where the season starts like months later, and it's a truncated season. And then if you win that season, there's a little asterisk. They say, "Oh, that wasn't a real win." That was not a real win. Yeah. Always, I'm. Mean, I'm in an NBA team today. What are you wearing? Atlanta Hawks. Oh my! I used to live in Atlanta. Yeah, I it was the you first went... time I went and saw an NBA game, and I remember I bought tickets on Craigslist. I thought I was gonna get scammed, and then this guy showed up, met me in the parking lot, and he had tickets to every section of the stadium. He's like, "What do you want?" And it was like an hour before the game. He was just sitting with all those tickets. I Some serious cash on that guy. Yeah, <laughs> serious, and I bought them off him, and it was great. Nice. Big stories of this week. Yes, speaking of content and streaming and the business models that drive them, it appears it would appear that the Z Sony merger has finally been approved. Approved. What do you think this means for for India? Are we heading towards a duopoly? Is it just going to be like Jio, maybe Hotstar, and then Z Sony? Yeah, and I then think everybody so. else. From what it looks like, definitely does. Yeah. Um, we'll have all our streaming guys who will be on one side, which is Amazon Prime um, and Netflix, which will be the third part of this, the third wheel. And then you'll have the Z Sony merged co on one side, and you'll have Jio on the other. Um, I don't know what Hotstar um, and Disney's fate is in India right now, because um, <clears throat> while they've lost about twelve million um, subscribers. I don't think it's really hurting globally uh, Disney that much, right? Because they were subsidized; they were not paying that much, uh, and it doesn't. And even though they've lost IPL, it's not. It, it's it's a it's a natural overflow that's gone away, 
right? Saying that sports viewers have now gone over to Jio. Um, maybe it'll give them a fresh start to be able to start producing good content, which is something that we can do in India as well, and have you know glo uh, globally relevant produced content from India that actually travels across Hulu and the Disney Network. Yeah. So yeah, I think it'll it will be it will be a duopoly from a from a broadcaster uh, mm -hmm. perspective, but we will have. A lot more studios, I think. I think we'll have a lot more studios. And yeah. We'll start probably syndicating a lot more content, selling a lot more content, which is something that we're good at and we should be doing. Yeah. And as a country, we any we know that our the you know our, the our ARPU or average revenue per user is definitely going to be lower. Yeah. So we might as well do what we are best at, which is exporting good yeah. stuff. Yeah. And I think that's a model that's kind of come back. I remember 2015, 16. Remember when we met the guys with Ari. And they were all exploring this model that said, you know, syndicating high quality content at low volumes yeah. is actually going to be interesting. Someone, I think we were talking about this earlier with Santosh that, you know, the BCCI should make their own app. Yeah. And I don't think so. I said, let someone who knows how to make an app, make an app. You, if you want to make one show and that's your uh, jam for the rest of your life, you make it and syndicate it. And who knows, like friends, people keep watching it. That's what this entire fight is about, right? Revenue, residual revenue. The fact that streaming has just changed the game. Um, when I'm when you're talking about residual revenue, which is what I'm also thinking of right now, if, if they're going to carry on this entire uh, fracas that they're, yeah. that they're that they're carrying on right now in terms of their contract, library content is going to be pulled out from cold storage. They are still going to get paid residual content. Yeah. yeah. They're going to get paid residuals based on their old contract yeah. because they'll constantly be running it. And you never know, like, Suits has come back into the limelight in a big way. Gilmore Girls got a new lease of life. Yeah. No, but I think, uh, speaking without knowing some of the specifics here, but I think some of these contracts, the day that they're not forward thinking is the day somebody takes a hit because they didn't foresee it. Yeah. I remember when I did the Stanford Ignite program, one of the case studies we had to study was called Forest Gump. And I was very excited because I thought it's about the movie or something. Because I really love the movie. I've always, I always have. But it turns out that in 93 or 94, uh, Forrest Gump was a watershed moment in, in contracts. Because up until that point, uh, contracts were structured very funnily. And apparently things blew up with Forrest Gump, if I'm not mistaken, because... Um, actors uh, used to get uh, a share of profit. Now, as a studio, you have no obligation to publicize how you amortize and distribute your costs, which means if you want to report profitability at an individual movie level, I think back in the day, there was no need to do it. You could be opaque about it. So apparently the top tier actors would do a share of revenue and everybody else would do a share of profit. But the profit is anybody's guess how they compute it, how they calculate it. So I think, uh, going back to the NBA example, I didn't know. Uh, our friend Nash had told me once that the NBA's collective bargaining agreement had a pandemic clause in it many, many years ago. And that's why in the last three years, they all got paid. They all got paid even though there was no NBA, there was no ad revenue. So I think there's something to be said about how those contracts get rewritten. Yeah. And, I, and you know, when you talk about that contract and uh, even in the town when they were, they were rehashing they were trying to figure out doomsday of, uh, with AI in Hollywood. It's not about not wanting AI there. It's about being fairly compensated for this. If there's a likeness of you being used and you're, and you know, you'd have otherwise been, got, otherwise you'd have gotten the job, pay the actor. Uh, but the script part of it is still murky, right? Because I could have an entirely new set of people at my writer's table and the studio anyway owns this IP. So, if 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 the table in itself is becoming AI enabled, then how do I actually compensate a writer that would have would, could have not gotten a job in the new writer's table to begin with? Those are the gray areas uh, that that are there in 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 uh, in AI and AI and content writing and so on and so forth. Speaking of gray areas, Disney and ESPN, and uh, Disney has gotten gone over to the dark side. They have brought on board um, Dave Portnoy's company, mm -hmm. uh, Barstool, Barstool Sports. Sports. And he has b bought back his company from Penn National, which he had sold to them in, I think it was a share exchange. And uh, you're going to be able to uh, be able to place bets uh, with less friction within their sports book. 
uh, it's very off brand because disney is very family friendly gambling is not yeah uh, but so much so that i i heard that in some of their uh, up until very recently on some of their cruise ships they wouldn't serve alcohol oh if you go to disney land in anaheim not adventureland disney land i think there's only one place where you get beer i don't think you get alcohol anywhere else you have to cross over to adventureland which is for teens and and above and that's where you actually have bars and and you know you can get alcohol there but it is superbly off brand for disney to actually have this but it's a sports brand so espn is 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 not entirely only wholesome family fun right there is lots more to sports that goes on I don't know what do you think about it do you think that uh, um I would move lately with all the narratives coming about Disney globally I I get very confused right there are days when I think they are they clutching about straws to sell. there are days where like they're hiring so I'm just like what is going on with these guys but um I was listening to the the strategy dithering podcast this morning where they actually said something which you just brought up they said Disney has always been the ultimate family safe brand. Yeah. And they were talking about it in the context of Disney and Apple and whether or not a move like that if it happens should it happen hypothesizing does it still retain cuz a uh, 80 100 year old brand I think this something like that that is known for being family safe you don't want to mess with it right? Yeah. Um so I don't know I I get the stuff about alcohol and betting but at the same time I also like uh, why is it not family safe it's all above board as long as it's legal but i i suppose keeping an image that clean requires you to make decisions that are not just about the legality of it yeah uh santosh was talking about how uh espn is also trying to get the leaks to start investing in espn so that it as as a brand and as a yeah. platform is uh is allowed to thrive instead of struggle uh and we were talking about how it's about time bcc i did something about their own streaming app and you know you had a you had an opinion on built versus buy yeah this is like there was a chief minister in karnataka hd kumar swami who once said i will build my own version of uber and then never never launched it or maybe he did and it didn't take off right i think these guys should stick to their st- don't build an app do not i don't think bcc should. the nba has an app it's okay It's okay. I mean, it, it's creaky and like it obviously cannot cater to low bandwidth. I mean, they're not a technology company, right? So I have watched it in low bandwidth uh, parts of the country, and it stinks, right? I miss being in front of my television and being able to watch it. But for me, I think when it comes to rights, the fact that they own or control the rights to I mean, it's not like you can't start alternate cricket leagues. There are many other cricket leagues, but nothing compares to what these guys have, and they're. right to the government so i think using their vantage point they need to play to their strengths yeah if you ask me if league should invest in espn it's anybody's guess there's um, more the competition to espn the way it is there in the us right oh uh, no no there is there is Who all the big broadcast cbs sports fox sports um, is espn leagues ahead of them in terms of viewership i think so the oldest yeah. as well yeah and the us is also or not just about the pro leagues right there's college ball sports and school sports that are just as popular and rabid people are rabid fans of uh, teams that are in and around where they live so there's a lot of uh local support and um, it's interesting i think the us and sport culturally is just so different from what we know and we are a sport crazy nation yeah but the us is a different league yeah speaking of crazy what's happening at x <laughs> <laughs> um i can't say x <laughs> i can't say twitter twitter um i keep i feel bad now cuz i can't find the app on my phone cuz i keep looking for, for the blue logo every time yeah um and it it say what you will about whether it's healthy or not that was my thing i woke up in the morning and i scrolled Strolled. twitter i'm up at 3 am getting my son to sleep and i have to wait 10 minutes with him till hold him upright and i look at twitter and now i'm like where's the app until today i it's right there it's on the front page of my phone but i just i can't find it it's not blue it's not the bird that I, yeah. i still retrain your brain yeah i don't want to <laughs> i don't want to um but they did something interesting this week which is they started to distribute ad revenue to creators and i'm sure youtube is smiling somewhere because they pioneered this not just for youtube but also for shorts right but here's the deal so x um basically paid out people who have a blue subscription 
not a verified subscription and it was a pleasant surprise i saw people on my twitter feed actually very happy about it they woke up to money in their account they didn't expect it it wasn't something that was promised it wasn't something that was announced and they just woke up to it so if you're verified you have at least 500 followers and if you've hit at least 3 million impressions in the last 3 months then you are eligible for a share of ad revenue and what is the bare minimum i know that uh, google has a 100 dollar bare minimum for you to so you reach. there is no bare minimum in terms of how much you can own but you can no, withdraw no for the revenue share so, no the, so the, this is what qualifies you mm-hmm. you have to be verified you have to have at least 500 followers and you have to have at least 3 million impressions that that is kind of reverse yeah. engineer that in in in, in google or youtube i remember with well, i don't know whether that's increased or not right now but you will see the amount of money yeah in your account but then they start splitting it with you once you hit 100 dollars ha huh. so these guys have sort of this arrangement because it's a revenue share mm. uh and you can withdraw as little as 10 dollars no oh, nice if you want but obviously this has opened up a can of worms right because the indian government's now wondering how to tax this yes um youtube had fantastic fingerprinting and how do you fingerprint a viral tweet if you write a tweet today that says oh here are 10 tricks to growing your business and i just copy it and tweet it out who's to know where the original and th- this has caused problems because people are copying viral tweets those are becoming viral yeah. and now they're getting a share and they're just paying the, the money for the blue subscription and now they're getting a share of revenue and i think this is going to be something that twitter has to has to solve next because youtube did this really well in the past even an obscure i know An- anil was talking about it he said you have a Taylor Swift song running in the background somewhere you do home get, video yeah YouTube you will, will get, catch it yeah you'll catch it and it's easier to fingerprint audio yes uh video also to some extent because you know you're able to if you're using yeah. uh certain frames you're yeah. able to figure out you know whether this is produced not produced yeah. uh and similar uh, and, and 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 similar uh, similarities in in different types of uh, uh cuts yeah. but text and but a hey, but actually If you look at all of your uh, uh I don't know what they're called now it's not coming to me when you when uh, f- you know those things where you can plagiarize where you can figure out whether you've plagiarized or not when you write a college essay or whatever else that should be something that will help you right understand provenance you think so you think so but um I I would imagine it's harder with the kind of content that's on Twitter because viral threads tips and tricks things like that things that actually go viral I think I think they're going to have to solve for it. um if they haven't already I'm, and i'm sure they're thinking about it but um there obviously is a way to figure this out um but unless they bake it into the monetization engine they're going to be facing a barrage of disputes and then i don't think they want to sit around and resolve those disputes yeah i don't think they want to be doing that they responded to digiday's request for an interview with a poop emoji so i really <laughs> doubt i really doubt they're going to be entertaining two viral tweeters xers who came and say i wrote this first i think they want to do that i've already cut 80% of their employee strength they don't have people to sit around and resolve disputes yeah i think this whole web3 thing should help them out i don't know i mean there is something in there for us to be able to f- understand provenance of the original tweet and where that went because But on the, on the positive side when i was looking at all of this it took me back to something that unmish had said uh, a while ago to us he said you know in the world of sport and also here he said we are witnessing the rise of the player publisher mm. where individuals have the ability to effectively become publishers because of their tweets their name their image their likeness um and this gives people the ability to know that there's an entirely different eco- economy they can play with i mean the people that were pleasantly pleasantly tweeting uh xing uh, the fact that they had received a payout were talking about the fact that i just do this for fun See that's the other shoe right yeah. that's going to drop which is the sustainability of actual publishing because if you look at publishing houses or content yeah. houses and studios they've been doing it for hundreds of years and they've compounded over time so my my one of my issues with player publishers right now is that at some point in time somebody will aggregate them or they'll get tired mm. how do you sustain yourself you can't be an army of one it's it, it takes a lot to be able to produce content look at this room right yeah. so there is it is it is not sustainable after a while if you are just by yourself and you have to really so you have to really put both feet in it if you want to make it a business yeah uh, and so for the consumer themselves it starts looking very fragmented and 
and all over the place if i can't go to one space to get my information a trusted source to go and get my information like there's new york times has a brand image washington post has a brand image certain types of journalists have brand images who are because they are also endorsed by these publications as well uh but then somebody who could be saying something of note literally on the digital soapbox like x or on twitter or whatever you want to call it right now how do you make sure that particular person your player publisher actually sustains themselves yeah. to become bigger and i and i assume these larger publishing homes will have a hand in this where they will try and give them endorse them in some way but also give them some kind of credibility and and also move it forward at a super elite level when it comes to player publishers i love the fact like the, the concept behind it right i uh, remember both lebron james and kevin durant in the nba as well as our indian superstar virat kohli is done either cream of the cream they've all arrived at this realization that yes they are a player publisher in the sense anything they retweet gets yeah massive reach and highly endorsed and just their name carries a lot of weight and is therefore monetizable but has to be done sustainably yes um and and, and uh, ethically and ethically right so i remember uh, joe pompliano the guy that does the huddle up uh, newsletter all about sports and business had interviewed kevin durant's uh, i want to say agent but at the end of that podcast i realized that it's not just about an agent they're not a representative right and he said something interesting he said player publishers at a certain uh, level of scale um the faster you realize that there is lebron james the person and there's lebron james the company and the ceo of lebron james the company should not be lebron james yes so the faster you realize that i'm a business man is he yeah. right but in this context it's actually very true that the person and the company should be disassociated and the person running the company should be someone who understands the value of their asset and is figuring out how to monetize that whether it's through creating co- Kobe Bryant retired from the NBA and started creating content. He won an Oscar. Kevin Durant has a production company. Uh Ryan Reynolds sells tequila, gin, something like that. Everybody's now selling gin and tequila. The Rock, The Rock has launched his What's own your, tequila. What brand. is your uh, alcohol of choice going to be when you become famous? Gin. Gin? Excellent. I think it's the classiest of all the uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of yeah. the drinks. Yeah, yeah. No mixers for you. No. Someone looked at me the other day and said gin made a face. What? I was like, what the hell? Got judged. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Um I want to move on to the last uh, uh piece of the news and then I want to do a sort of review. Apps Flyer has launched a uh, chat GPT integration into their data clean room where effectively marketers can pose questions as opposed to running SQL queries and predefined queries, right? And um I think it's it's interesting for several reasons, right? Um we were at the AWS Gen AI summit. Uh it was a round table 10 days ago. And it was the most fascinating round table I've sat in. There were people there who have achieved great things. There was a gentleman who was on the original team that built Hadoop. There were three of Ola's original engineers. And so there's a lot of people there who've seen scale in this. There was Voiro. There was Voiro, yeah, we were there with all of the work that we've done in 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 the ad tech space, right? And it was specifically focused around gen ai meets saas and what does it mean and i loved the fact that there was a range of opinion like lena would have loved it nobody agreed with anybody else <laughs> right there was um, there was one opinion where this gentleman said it's still early days nobody knows he said the italian dressing has now been shaken and nobody knows how it's going to land it's all kind of up in the air i did not get that analogy <laughs> but uh, maybe it's got to get all mixed <laughs> up in it <laughs> um <laughs> no but there was a very clear consensus or consensus i mean for not them. getting the analogy you know it verbatim <laughs> <laughs> yeah i pay attention to the most useless things around me uh that's yeah it's unfortunately how i'm built um but 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 but, but there was consensus about a couple of things right one is the fact that unlike fads of the past this is not a fad it's here to stay it's transformational the b2c space has move the head but b2b is still kind of figuring out its its trajectory uh and there were a lot of talk about how founders should think about it um how do you how do you decide uh your llm of choice are you going to work with especially in, in b2b saas like us is it is it llama is it open ai is it 
but can you build your own llm and so there's a lot of talk about how to go about doing this and whether or not you as a technology provider leave yourself vulnerable the one thing that made a lot of sense is they said this will this is a train everyone has to catch you cannot miss it but what's immediately apparent is the game has changed if you build a moat it's probably gone you have to reinvent it you have to figure out how to apply this the foundational ai space is spoken for um it's going to be a monopoly because the capital you need and this goes back to sam altman making that statement which people got offended by when rajan asked when it is our national past time you know um but he basically said you, you, should, you should you should try anyway but you cannot right because it needs tens of millions of dollars and years yeah. and years and years of actually putting it together yeah. yeah um but while the foundational ai space is spoken for there's a lot that can be done on an application uh, level where we either leverage data or leverage uh, a crispr user experience or solve a specific problem and from that perspective i think the game has been reinvented from two angles one is uh modes of the past may not hold but also too i think personal productivity is something that everybody should think of while there is this debate is it going to replace jobs is it going to do this is it going to do that is it going to take over the world is it going to like make us all extinct and i'm sure there's enough arguments on about each of those In the last 3 weeks uh there's a couple of folks on my team and i who've just decided to use ai tools in our day to day life and it is i feel like i'm in a, a child in a candy store it has been the most fascinating run in the last 3 weeks i have a friend ani who runs everything ai which is a marketplace for ai tools so he kind of jammed with us and walked us through some tools but between gamma mid journey and of course chat gpt and and bard and steve.ai um so many tools that can just take i making decks for example just take me 3 to 4 hours last week made a deck in like 5 minutes It's good enough. It's good enough to like run the. Yeah, it's good enough to at least get get it off the ground. Yeah, right. Which, which is the biggest thing that we have as human beings: the whole yeah. procrastination bit of how do I get to step two? Because yeah. step one is so difficult. Whether you're making a straw straw man for your presentation or trying to figure out how do we begin this email. Uh, so I feel like we're gonna we're we're gonna move past the procrastination yeah. phase with AI by just asking. It's also gonna yeah. make us very lazy. I don't know. you know i think there's a way to leverage it to our advantage you were uh, also saying that you have to know how to ask prompt yeah yeah um i was i went down a mid journey rabbit hole the other day where more than sort of what i was looking for i started just getting curious about how other people prompt because mid journeys run off of a discord server where you can see other people running their prompts and you can borrow them you can copy them you can just watch it it's very fascinating to see how other people's prompts evolve and the level of detail that they go into um i think it's fun we did an exercise uh, devin from my my team and i we were doing an exercise yesterday where we were thinking about how to construct uh, a certain vision and instead of saying hey make me a deck to go present it to my ceo we flipped the equation and said if you were presenting to me how would you present this and we actually consumed a deck as opposed to using it to make a deck for somebody else or uh, be more productive and it was so interesting because it made a deck and we just sat back and consumed and we were like oh that's how someone would present this to me and that's now it's clear what works and what doesn't work so there's also an element of ai being used by us for something else as well as us consuming something from these tools there i think there's different relationships yeah. that we can have i was also reading this uh, article on the information about how youtube has been collecting decades of data now on our watching habits on on user user generated content with video and now we've got ai in uh, uh google as well and uh, there has been some shake up inside google where they have collapsed two teams and they have they are using ai on youtube and one of the most basic use cases that you can use ai to create videos and this is something that hollywood also should be on the lookout for right a technology player will come in and eat their lunch before it's too late because you can make movies out of different parts of other movies and create a completely different piece of seemingly original content you can take an existing piece of content and then redecorate it from an ai perspective to make it applicable to some other section of uh, society so there is a lot that's being done on the ai uh, space and the generative ai space as well that's making it easy but from a productivity thing i still have to get on the bandwagon i ha- i don't really go to chat gpt you cannot get off it yeah i, have, I haven't really really yeah. explored it except for 
you know, when it first came out to ask it some questions and see what it kind of generated and and yeah. things like that. But uh, it's an, it's a it's interesting. And also, it also makes me feel a little cheated <laughs> on some levels, right? I'm like, hey, is this person actually writing this, or is this somebody else writing it? Like this, there is this part of my brain that's constantly trying to figure out whether this is something that they thought of. So should I be complimenting them yeah. for that this idea, this way of writing? Because a lot of times when you write an email or you write an article, you while the subject matter is something that is already something that we are circling around as an organization, you complement the writing, yeah. right? Now I don't know whether I, need to, I can complement the writing or no because it may not have been written by them. But my take there is depending on the context, I either care or I don't care. Yeah, like if it's Let's say I'm interviewing someone and they give me a body of work written by any AI bot. I'm just like, okay, but I want to know how how good you are. Yeah. But internally, the quality of my entire team's emails have gotten ten x better overnight. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I mean, you, I, yeah, you got to figure out what your knock stars and how you want to get there. Yeah. Is secondary, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so the the whole AI AI part of it, generative AI part of it is very interesting, especially in the B2B space, which brings me to the last episode that you did with Lava Kumar. Yeah. And you asked him a question as to what does the future hold? And what do you say? So, like the episode with both Shivain and Krishna Rao, it was extraordinary learning for us. It was a masterclass in everything from attention um, to uh, subconscious decision making just this whole world beyond viewable impressions in the ad space, right? Um, and I remember I was, I was talking to Devin about it. And I, at one point I said, hey, this ad, is it viewable? He said, yes. Did you notice it? No. And that's what it's all about. That's what uh, Kumar was talking about. He said, we got to a point where we assumed that viewability was... Attention. Uh, equivalent to attention and it is not. It is not, right? Uh, two statistics. One... 60%, 65% of the effectiveness of a campaign is the creative. Nothing else, not the targeting, nothing else. And if you break uh, the the effectiveness of advertising into three groups, it's context, uh, channel, and creative. If I'm not mistaken. Um, now, the three Cs, like the, three the diamond. Cs, yeah. Now, 60% um, is the creative. And apparently... The, the retail industry is waking up, the CPG industry is waking up to the fact that 95% of decision making is subconscious. It's not based on any rational thought. And you put those two together and suddenly everything's a different game. Suddenly uh, 1960s advertising now makes sense. Now makes sense. Yeah. You have a doctor smoking on TV every day and one day I'm like, I should smoke. <laughs> doctor doing it. Um, but, in line with this, we were talking about attention and how important. And then we got into, of course, how to measure it and how they work and what products they have. And it's a fascinating sort of body of work that they're putting together. But that's when we also said, okay, great. So what does the future look like? And one of the things he was saying is um, there's a lot that we do that's not connected to the mood of the person. And if decision making is subconscious, we're not taking into account the mood of the advertiser. And you remember at IBC, there was a panel that we watched where they talked about mood-based content recommendations. Yes. Right? Um, I'm feeling low. Yes. So show me something yes, happy. Yes, yeah. yes. And so in a similar vein, he was talking about how the mood of the person plus the mood and context of the content can actually be used to drive the ad. And when I asked him, I said, paint the future, where is this going? He said something to the effect of, the ad requests of the future will not fetch the creative, it will generate the creative. Stable diffusion models are getting faster and faster. All of this funky stuff that we're doing, we're still kind of playing with it as a team. Um, Mid-journey is generating images in like 10 seconds, 15 seconds. And I, David Sachs on the All In podcast talked about the fact that the march of technology does not stop for anybody. And if you assume that that's going to keep going forward, it's going to get faster. It's going to get better. It's going to get easier from a policy and, and attribution perspective. I am sure. I don't think the world will allow that to happen. But this is a very cool example of a vision. Right? That is like, you will realize that you don't have to serve the ad to millions of people to get a 0.5% click-through rate. The click-through rate is not a proxy for anything. But if I give you a million people, you can figure out how to contextualize, generate a creative on the fly and show it to the subset that matters at that point in time. 
and actually be effective in your relationship with that consumer as an advertiser it's a i think he's a, uh, the way i sort of abstract that he's teasing a different world altogether um i i remember the there was an andreessen horowitz podcast where they talked about the fact that the first movies that came out used to film a, a staged plays in the theater and then just show it on a screen right you just replicated something that was already happening offline and movies of today have cgi and experiences and this and that so i think technology will first replicate the game that's currently there and then change it and that seems to be the case here this whole thing about you know more things change the more they remain the same so what you just spoke about where you're saying that uh, getting down to digital metrics of click through rates as proxies for effectiveness of an ad uh focusing on the creativity of the ad and how it tugs on to the subconscious of a human being's emotion yeah. and attention is not uh is not a proxy for a viewability is not an, a proxy for attention and they are not even comparable goes back to when i was just when i when i when i said you know now 1960s advertising makes sense when advertisements were made in the past they were stories they were actually pieces of content that tapped into human insights and the way creative briefs were written they were written with huge amounts of qualitative research behind it and they actually they would personify the brand to a brand personality like what you were just talking about player publishers and how sports players today actually have their personalities uh made into a brand at something that could travel across various modes of communication uh, a a soft drink or a soap or a shampoo etc would actually have it the other way around they would have a particular brand personality that would be attributed to that particular soap like you if i say ax today you know what the quintessential ax man is he's an irreverent dude who just who's like taking life on as it comes and and you know is is kind of throwing caution to the wind but he's not he's not your uh uh 10 on 10 handsome dude right he's 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 an irreverent and he's he, you can kind of see him in your mind's eye so what technology is doing today is giving us tools to be able to quantify it and play with that uh but i i feel like it's like like I, like when you're talking i'm like this is not new information this is this is information that is being said in a better way it's being tracked in a better manner it's being it's being uh, and i i think that we kind of veered off the path in the last maybe 10 12 years by having very transactional ads yeah, and like mainstream advertising became like point of sale advertising trying to drive a transaction it 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 had no business being there it would have been that kind of advertising in the past would have been at the counter of a shopkeeper's cash till right not on my big screen now it's all coming back uh, so it's good it's good news for us and i think that's uh, the the yeah, other piece of good news is that we've completed 50 episodes if somebody missed that news i don't know which rock you were hiding under <laughs> um there's a very nice video of us that's uh, that's doing the rounds out there um we also have uh we also had a team up over here for uh, capsat right uh, when he spoke about their trip to to, to dubai and our favorite episode uh, has been the one that was on trust it was very like a meta episode that yeah, we spoke it, about yeah still my favorite yeah a whole bunch of other things but net net when i look back at the episodes that we have done in season 4 uh, a lot of them carried uh, uh, you know there was there were nobody held back they were very honest uh, episodes where people spoke about what they knew shared freely uh, their conversations with us about their work and you know what they were solving for and I think like you keep saying you know you took your curiosity for a walk unafraidly and I think that's the future of where we need to go even as people ask questions and yeah. be don't be afraid to be curious Yeah yep I think it is a nice note to end this season Yep and we will be back soon with season 5 Good lord Season 5 not bad Next So we're still sticking with 13 episodes a season I mean like house do, of cards Yeah why do we change anything I think it's a good thing. More things change the more they stay the same. Yeah, more things change yeah. the more they stay the same. The same stay, stay the same. My goodness, I really have to do calisthenics before this uh, <laughs> podcast. <laughs> anyway, so that brings us to the end of this episode, end of this week. Thank God. It's great it's Friday. Thank you everybody for listening. Thank you Anand, thank you Gautam, thank you Lena, thank you Santosh and we will see you at the beginning of our next season. Bye.